Thank you everybody for joining us once again this evening with the Crested Butte Mountain Heritage Museum and Colorado State Historian Dwayne Vandenbush. My name is Nell Paquette. I'm the curator here at the Crested Butte Mountain Heritage Museum. Dwayne, what number is this? Is this number eight? Nine. This is number nine. Okay. Uh, the museum would like to start this evening by giving a quick land acknowledgement as per usual. The museum recognizes that we are guests here on this land, historically Ute territory. We acknowledge that the Uncompahgre Ute and the Tavawatch Ute were forcibly removed from this area due to the Bruno Treaty and the manipulation that followed. We hope that you will take time to visit our neighbor, the Ute Museum, located in Montrose, Colorado, with exhibits developed in partnership with the Ute tribes at, by History Colorado, our state historic society. While we can never do this history justice, we do include information about the Paleo Indians of the Gunnison Valley, the Ute people, the Bruno Treaty, and the Los Pinos Indian Agency in our exhibits. We hope that you will consider becoming members or making a donation to support this program and all the work that we do here at the museum. You can do that by visiting our website, ChristiButteMuseum.com. Walking tours continue through the end of the month, so not many left here. Walking tours every Saturday at 2 p.m. For a private walking tour for three or more, you can schedule it at your own convenience, even in the off season. Just give us a call, 970-349-1880 to be able to schedule that. This program is being recorded. It will be available at CrestedButteMuseum.com and on our YouTube page. Give us about a week to be able to get this uh, video up online and available to everybody. It takes us a little time to get that done. If you have questions about our programming, visit ChrisButeMuseum.com or you can find us on Facebook and on Instagram or sign up for our newsletter where we send out all of our new information each month. A huge thank you to our lead sponsor, Western Colorado Alumni Relations, Western Colorado University Alumni Relations, as well as Bluebird Realty and Bill Petros. We will have time for questions at the end of the talk. Please post them in the chat and the Q&A. And are we doing trivia this week, Dwayne? We are. All right. And finally, we have a special guest with us this evening. Uh, we have Ashley who is joining us. And Ashley, uh, she is going to be the new curator. Uh, for those of you that don't already know, I am stepping down from my position here at the Crested Butte Mountain Heritage Museum. And Ashley, who is wonderful and fantastic and has already been a part of our museum family for several years, she's gonna be taking my place. So Ashley, if you just wanted to share a couple things about yourself. Hi everybody, I'm Ashley. I am really excited for this position at the Crested Butte Museum. I interned there um, two summers ago, before COVID. Um, and so I'm really excited to get this chance. I think I'm most excited about creating exhibits and just meeting everybody in the community and that are coming to visit to share the history and the history like outside of Crested Butte as well throughout the whole Gunnison Valley. So really excited, uh, great big shoes to fill someone said. Yes, I totally agree and I'm really nervous. So I'll probably be texting now for quite a long time. <laughs> um, but a little bit about me, I am graduating from Western this May uh, with a degree in history with an emphasis in public history. And I minored in anthropology and actually uh, Dr. Vandenbush is currently one of my professors. <laughs> um, and so I'm really excited that I've been able to remain in the Valley. Um, and yeah, I'm just really nervous at the same time too. So. We, are, we are happy to have uh, Ashley on board. And Nell, I want you to tell everybody what you're gonna be doing. Well, that is a great question. I am planning on hiking a lot. <laughs> I'm planning on kind of relaxing and taking a deep breath. And every time I say this, I scare the bejesus out of Ashley because uh, she is now taking on all this hard work. Um, I am gonna be working a couple jobs here in town. I'm not going anywhere from Crested Butte. So you guys can all find me around town and I'll still be volunteering for the museum, but now I'll actually have time to enjoy the beautiful place that we live. And uh, I'm planning on living that Crested Butte relaxed lifestyle for a little bit. I'm looking forward to it. Okay, Nell. Well, listen, it's uh, great to have both of them on board and I'm looking forward to working with Ashley. I guess uh, you're gonna be on for a couple more times, Nell, and then the last one I'll be working with Ashley. 
I'd like to start off tonight by reminding everybody that it is Flauschenk coming up next week. And on Wednesday evening on March the 31st, I'm gonna be giving my slideshow that I usually do in person, but it'll be virtual. And it is gonna be at seven o'clock on Wednesday, March 31. And I'm gonna have Nell come back and tell everybody how to get on the Flauschenk show on Wednesday. That's right, everybody. It's time to polka again and have a slideshow. Wednesday, next week, seven o'clock as usual. Um, you can find the link to register at crestedbuttemuseum.com. It's on our homepage at the very top. So it's really hard to miss. Again, crestedbuttemuseum.com on our website homepage, main page, right there at the very top. And we hope to have a lot of people on board for Flauschenk. That'll be Wednesday evening, March 31. I'm gonna give a uh, history of skiing in uh, the Gunnison country. And it's gonna be pretty exciting. So we've always had a great time. We're even gonna sing a little uh, song called Springtime in the Rockies. I also wanna mention then on Friday uh, from five to seven, right across from Cochibers, they are gonna have uh, uh, some polka dancing. I think Lorenzo is going to be playing the accordion this time and they're going to crown the king and the queen. So you hope to have a number of people, a uh, good number of people show up for that and we'll do a little polka dancing right on Elk Avenue. And then the following day on Saturday at 11 o'clock, they're going to have the parade. So enough on that. I'd like to say uh, hi to a young lady that I skied with at Lake City who uh, lives in Lake City part-time and Texas part-time and her name is Carson Shepard. So Carson, I know you're on board tonight and it's good to have you on board again. It was great to meet you. We will have a trivia question again tonight for the Crested Butte book and that'll be uh, asked at the end of the talk tonight. So I also wanna thank the sponsors and also Kevin Sanderford of Colorado Investments who's first furnishing all of these books that we give away every week. I also wanna thank Nell. We've got 462 people registered for this uh, session, this uh, history we're doing on Crested Butte and the surrounding area. This is to the topic number nine tonight out of 12. The last one will be on April the 15th. Tonight, the topic is gonna to be Gothic. Next week, the topic is going to be Lake City and Aspen, two satellite towns that had a big impact on Crested Butte. Now, one of the things I wanted to mention at the start of this, I'm thinking of doing a 12-part series by Zoom on Colorado history in the fall. So after this session is over, I'd like to hear a couple of comments from you folks to see if you're interested in something like that. It would be done on Thursday night. It would be free and it's going to be done virtually on Zoom. So here we go. The topic is Gothic. In the beautiful Elk Mountains, 9,994 feet with 12,600 foot Gothic Peak towering over it. Eight miles north of Crested Butte. If you continue on that road, you go over Schofield Pass at 10,707 feet then go through the Crystal Canyon and the Fear Devil's Punch Bowls and then on your way to Crystal and Marble. Six miles to the west up Copper Creek is East Maroon Pass, 11,800 feet. You drop off of that, you go right into Aspen. Gothic was one of the top five silver towns of the Gunnison country. Today and since 1928, it's been the home of the famous Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory. It has a great placer mining history, great load mining history, transportation, biology, mountain bike history with 401 and Deer Creek right nearby. Carl Haas was one of my master's students in the 1970s and he has written a terrific master's thesis entitled Gothic City of Silver Wires. Ian Billick has it as, as the uh, director of Rocky Mountain Biological Lab. We've also got it in the Western State, uh, the Western Colorado University Library. So all kinds of great mines around Gothic, Queens Basin, Copper Creek, Virginia Basin, Bellevue, Peak, all of these areas had great mines. So let's take a look at it. The placer mining decade of the 1860s involved what today is Gothic. 
Mining took place up Washington Gulch at a great mining camp called Minersville, visited by John Franklin Dyer, the great Methodist missionary. The East River then called Rock Creek. And then also in surrounding areas, up Copper Creek, Slate River, all around Gothic, placer mining took place in the 1860s and the 1870s with an estimated four to 500 miners involved. And I believe they took out about $3 million worth of placer gold, which at that time sold at 20 an ounce. Today, of course, it sells at $1,900 an ounce. So by today's prices, a lot of gold taken out of here from the streams in and around the Gunnison country. One of the earliest people to come into this area was a man named General Green, and he was a black man. And he came in here with Jim Brennan, for whom Lake Irwin was originally named. The original name of Lake Irwin was Lake Brennan with a D on the end of his name. And a number of others were in the Gothic area as early as 1872. Gustav Erickson, who came in here with the Parsons Geological Expedition of 1873, prospected in the Gothic area for 30 years. And he was the guy who buried General Green at the head of Rock Creek in 1874, one year after General Green had come in. Ferdinand Hayden of the Great Surveys of the American West was the man who gave the name of Gothic Peak by standing on top of Mount Tiakali, looking off in the distance and say, citing a couple of peaks that he called the Crested Buttes. Later on, they figured that one of the peaks more resembled a Gothic cathedral, hence the name of Gothic Peak at 12,600 feet. The other one, they just dropped the S and that became known as Crested Butte Mountain. One of Hayden's men, Sam Emmons, has Mount Emmons right where Red Lady Basin is, named for him. Then when the Placer decade ended around the year 1870, miners began to follow the Colorado mineral belt into the Gunnison country and began to engage in load mining. And that meant they went deep into the earth to get the ore out and they had to smelt it. There's a great photo of Gothic in 1880. And you can see the main drag and you can also see tents. And that's when it was really starting to build up. The initial men coming into Gothic as load miners were the Jennings brothers, who were financed by a man named O.B. Sands of Chicago. And they found the famous Sylvanite mine, three miles up Copper Creek in 1879. Only 26 families stayed in Gothic during the winter of 79 and 80, and they were snowed in with the only lifeline, a mail carrier by the name of Louis Barthel. His daughter said, and I'm quoting, I have often known him to carry a five gallon can of coal oil and a 50 pound sack of flour besides the regular mail. One day when Louis Barthel skied into Gothic in the wintertime, he carried a 10 gallon can of coal oil in for one of the miners and he thought that was too heavy and it made him mad. And when this guy ordered a pair of hip boots to be brought in on the next visit, Louis Barthel got even by bringing in the hip boots one at a time. In that same year, in 1880, William McKee, one of the early people to come into the town, described the town as having many saloons and gambling places and two dance halls. Every night, he said, a big bonfire was lit in the camp and a crowd would gather telling stories. Foot races came with many money, much money changing hands. McKee told of a small bow-legged racer at Gothic who everybody thought was unbeatable. Crested Butte thought they had a man who could beat him and a race was set up. 100 yards down Gothic's main street on a Sunday afternoon. A lot of betting came. And then Gothic gamblers got the word that maybe their man was gonna throw the race. The runner from Gothic got the news that if he lost, he probably would lose his life. The Gothic runner won big. Crested Butte got even a little later on by sending a good runner into Gothic under the pretext of being highly intoxicated. 
He entered a lot of races and he lost all of them until the betting went way up against him. And then he won that big race, taking a lot of Gothic money as he won it. Tremendous avalanches came off 12,600 foot high Gothic peak. Louis Barthel's daughter said, quote, we used to hear the loud roaring and watch the huge slides that came down from Gothic Mountain across the river from the town. When one of the residents died that winter of 1879 and 80, a local artist carved out a picture of the funeral procession, winding up a hill in the swirling snow. The woodcut wound up in the pages of the New York Police Gazette as a typical life of the Wild West. And there you see the USONA, U-S-O-N-A mine, 1879 and 80, just a little north of Gothic. Gothic was at its peak from 1880 to 82. It had 1,000 people in camp and another 3,000 people in the surrounding area. It had the Olds Hotel, 27 rooms, and a three-story Gothic hotel with 32 rooms built by Captain William Bunn in 1880. By 1924, the roof had caved in and the rest was torn down for lumber. Gothic also had two smelters, three newspapers, the Elk Mountain Bonanza, the Gothic Miner, and the Silver Record, three sawmills, many stores, 14 saloons, a city hall, and rich mines. There was a lot of gambling, drinking, and prostitution there. Boxing matches were very popular on the weekends with champions from different camps fighting with a lot of money bet on their local candidate. One of the guys who fought in Gunnison and on the Western Slope was the great heavyweight champion of the world, Jack Dempsey, who later on went to New York, got a great promoter named Tex Rickard, and was the boxing heavyweight boxing champion of the world from 1919 to 1926. Another sport was shooting with rifle or pistol. This was highly regarded at a time when wild game was needed, when Indians were dangerous, and when bad men existed. In 1879 in Gothic, in a shooting contest, 20 gas ball, glass balls were set up at 50 yards and competitors from many mining camps competed. The winner was from Crystal. He hit eight of the balls with a pistol from 50 yards away. The Gothic paper said this about their candidate, quote, as the prize money was very large, Mills felt his defeat keenly. He may be able to make a good bullseye on a barn door, but he's not able to cope with a glass ball. The betters from Gothic uh, obviously a little discouraged because they lost money on him. Gothic also had a cornet band in 1879. It was one of the best ever in the Elk Mountains. It was one party described it as a gay one. It included the elite of the camp. Rosy women who required neither powder nor paint to make them beautiful were there. And that cornet band played polka, shottishes, and Virginia reels. Gothic also became very important early as a transfer center for camps to the north, and especially for the number one silver camp in the world, Aspen, which didn't get a railroad until late 1887. It was common to see four to 500 Rocky Mountain Canaries. These are burrows. When they got overloaded, they sat down and emitted a shrill whistle, which reminded miners of a canary. These burrows carried 200 pounds of ore to Gothic over East Maroon Pass, and then down Copper Creek, through Gothic, and on the way to a railhead at Crested Butte. They would return then to Aspen with 200 pounds of supplies on their back. A passenger and a rail line ran over the pass and a dinner station and stables and a corral with a small, board, a small boarding house existed near Copper Lake. In the winter, bobsleds and sleighs were used. 
The original road into Gothic in 1879 and 80 was along the East River via the East River Toll Road. The following year in 1881, Gothic residents realized that several miles could be saved by putting a road in around the base of Snodgrass Mountain and into camp. And that was the Crest of Butte and Gothic Toll Road. And that's pretty much the road that we have today. A highlight of 1880 was the visit of ex-president U.S. Grant to the Crystal River Valley by way of Irwin and Crested Butte. Grant came in by Barlow and Sanderson stage from Salida and then with Governor Frederick Pitkin and ex-governor John Rout. He came in, came in via a mule team and drove to Crested Butte and then Gothic. Grant drove most of the way. He never liked anybody else driving. Grant was escorted into town by a brass band and an explosion from the town's powder supply. He was then given a reception and a ball and he stayed at the Olds Hotel, whose name was then changed to the Grant Hotel. And he got involved in gambling with the miners and they deliberately tried to lose to Grant so they could say that he owned Gothic stock. But Grant held his liquor, realized what was going on, and that never happened. A great writer named Ernest Ingersoll in the early 1880s said that the main street of Gothic went uphill and had a double row of frame buildings. A few side streets he had, he said, had log cabins. And I'm quoting, many of the trees had been cut down and nothing interrupted the view straight up toward the rocky walls and close foothills. Promising silver mines surrounded Gothic, up Copper Creek with the Great Sylvanite. Rock Creek or the Crystal River had the Whopper. Maroon Creek had the Terror. Brush Creek had the Luana. Rustler Gulch, the Triumph. Washington Gulch had the Painter Boy. And there you get a great shot of Gothic with a three-story Gothic hotel that you can see right out in the middle. Major problems very early included high freight rates, $15 a ton to ship ore to smelters in Canyon City before the railroad got to Crested Butte. Very difficult winters, avalanches, the falling price of silver and lack of high grade ore. And there you get a great look at that three story Gothic hotel, 1881. Pretty fancy for the great mining town. Things were exciting during the boom times of Gothic. The camp had two dance halls and in one, and I'm quoting, the girls wore skirts about to the knee very shocking in Gothic. Now there you see what is uh, labeled the Silver Knight Mine, it's misspelled, that's the Silver Knight Mine, located three miles up Copper Creek. And that one produced $1 million. It was one of the five great silver mines in the Gunnison country. And there you can see a couple of guys stockpiling ore during the winter time. And you can see that their cabin is just about covered up three miles up Copper Creek. Every evening in Gothic during those early boom years, a big bonfire was lighted, lighted on the main street and a huge crowd gathered, telling stories and singing. Sometimes there were foot races, as I've already mentioned with money bet. On Sundays, horse races were the order of the day and they were run on the road on the edge of town. At night, a four-piece orchestra played for dances. I'm quoting again. The miners were a tough bunch, said the newspaper account, but stealing was unheard of. Half the population carried guns, but there were only two killings. An innocent man was shot in the tent by a drunk, and an unarmed man was shot on Main Street in a quarrel over a lot. Nell, go back to that previous photo, if you would. There, ladies and gentlemen, are some of the silver bars that came out of the great silver mines of Gothic. And that was worth a lot of money when silver was selling at a buck an ounce. 
a minister by the name of C.C. Cregan started a congregational church with 18 members in 1881. The town didn't want one denomination. Cregan walked from Alpine to Hillerton in Taylor Park and then got a ride on a wagon by men coming into Gothic to start a saloon. As soon as Cregan found out what these guys were going to do, he asked to be let off the wagon and he said to the guys carrying that liquor, quote, it seems we are going in different directions. I hope we meet again and that we'll be going the same way next time. The church that he set up had rude wooden slabs laid on blocks. Along with the church came gambling, drinking, and prostitution. Two of the top madams in town had names like Tin Can Laura and Pass Out. She was called Pass Out because if she got too much to drink, she passed out and there wasn't any business. There's a great shot of early Gothic, 1882. You can see the hotel way over on the right and that majestic Gothic peak rising 3,000 feet above the town at 12,600 feet. The Elk Bonanza newspaper had a writer who came in to visit and his name was Fitz Mack. His real name was James McCarthy. And he wrote in a magazine in New York called The Great Divide. And he told of the hanging of a Chinese man in 1881. They were hated because of ethnicity and because they drove wages down. This one, a Chinese laundry, it called a washi house, drove prices down for the washerwomen of the camp. When the Chinese refused to leave, an anti-Chinese group ordered the pigtailed man hung. And Fitz, Pat, uh, Fitz Mac or James McCarthy said, they took the Chinaman out and hung him to the nearest tree. Now there you got a great picture of the Mountain King mine high up on Rustler Gulch. And you can see the tram taking ore from the mine all the way down to the bottom. And you can see an ore car on the bottom and an ore car about two thirds of the way up. Charles Avery, one of the early pioneers of Gothic and for whom nearby Avery Peak is named, died in 1883 from a fall over what the newspaper called, and I'm quoting, a precipice near Gothic where he had been for three years. It occurred when he was visiting mines that he owned. He fell 350 feet, recovered some, returned home to Chicago where he died. He was only 31 years old and he was worth $200,000 and part owner of the Elgin Watch Company. Gothic people supported the Elk Mountain Narrow Gauge Railroad which they hoped would run along the East River from Crested Butte and then continue on to Crystal and Marble in the 1880s. They also were very happy to hear that the Denver and Rio Grande might build a railroad over 11,800 foot high East Maroon Pass and then down into Aspen. Avalanches were tremendous problems in the Gothic area. In 1886, slides came off East Maroon Pass during a storm, swept the stage off the road, killed two horses and buried the driver who was able to dig himself out. In January of that year, a terrific storm hit the Crested Butte Gothic region, dropped two foot of snow. Four Crested Butte men were killed in a snow slide on East Maroon Pass. Four others dug themselves out. Another avalanche hit cabins near Gothic, killing three and entombing five all night. When dug out, they were barely alive. Jack trains out of Crested Butte were caught in slides. And at the Excelsior Mine in Poverty Gulch near Pittsburgh on the Slate River, three Crested Butte men were killed by a slide also in 1886. The top mine in Gothic, and one of the top five in the history of the Gunnison country was the great Sylvanite at 11,700 feet up Copper Creek. 
That mine turned out a million dollars of wire silver at $1 an ounce. Today, silver is at about 19 an ounce. Now, if you keep going up Copper Creek, three miles farther up, you come to Copper Lake, and there it is. And then from Copper Lake, you go above over East Maroon Pass at 11.8, drop down Maroon Creek, and eventually into, Ashcro into Aspen. Robert Strayhorn, a writer in 1880, visited the Sylvanite and said this, in all the openings, the richest silver ore I have ever seen in large masses is the Sylvanite. Next to it was the Moss Rose, a sack of wire and native silver from that mine weighed 43 pounds and was put on exhibition in a Cleveland banking house. Gothic was the center of great snowshoer ski races in the 1880s, involved all the mining camps of the Gunnison country, Irwin, Crested Butte, Crystal, Gunnison, and Gothic. There you're looking at a cabin in 1882, two miles north of Gothic, and that would be on the road towards Schofield Pass. The race, the snowshoe race in Gothic, which is a ski race, of course, in 1886 was on a very steep run on the side of Gothic Mountain. 17 skiers raced in heats of three, 1900 feet long facing town. Frank Williams of Crystal won the race in 22 seconds. And we all know from one of my earlier lectures, skis nine to 14 feet long, weighed eight pounds, leather toe piece for the mining boot, four inch heel blocks or your heel could come up but not go back, seven foot guide pole, and you're racing on snow that had not been prepared. The only way you really got around in those days was if you were able to ski and everybody had to learn how to ski. And I'm quoting from one of the individuals in town at that time, he said, Every man and woman and child had to learn to ski in Gothic. We had to learn if we wanted to get anywhere. All outlying districts were inhabited in those days. Irwin, Gothic, Crystal, Pittsburgh, and all over the Elk Mountains. If residents wanted to come to Crested Butte, they had to come on skis. And it was not uncommon to see 50 pair of them in front of MJ's store while miners were inside buying goods. Two interesting ski stories came down to us from Gothic. Now there's a great shot of Gothic in uh, well, it was June the 26th, 1950. Two of the interesting ski stories that came down to us from Gothic. One involved a man named Captain Bunn, who was a mine owner of Gothic, who attempted to eliminate the guide pole while skiing in 1887. The newspaper said this, Said contrivance consists of strong cords, one end of which is fastened to the tip of each ski. He handles these cords in the same manner he would the reins over a team of runaway horses. He is a fine sight to see when the captain comes a clipping down a steep run, but still finer sight when his shoes began to buck as they will persist to do several times. There was also another incident that involved a man by the name of Frank LaBelle. And I'm gonna to talk to you about that a little bit. This came in March of 1884 in Wolverine Basin, not far from Gothic. Frank LaBelle was skiing when he heard a noise behind him. It was a mountain lion. And LaBelle went down the mountain at about 30 miles an hour to escape the mountain lion, but he, on the bottom he had to cross a ravine. With his pocket knife between his teeth, he crossed the ravine and made for a big tree. Just when he got to the tree, the mountain lion lunged at him 20 feet, but buried himself in the deep snow. As the mountain lion's head appeared, LaBelle hit him with a pole. They fought for a minute with LaBelle using his pole to hit the lion. He took wounds in return. Finally, LaBelle jumped on the back of the lion and cut the juggler with his knife. He then skied into Gothic 
and led a party back to gut the lion, which measured nine feet, two inches. Two famous situations occurred in the 1880s and 90s, which had a big impact on Gothic. One, of course, was Crested Butte's coking coal, which with lime at the limestone quarry on the east side of Monarch Pass, molten iron from Trinidad, and the blast furnace of Henry Besmer turned iron into steel. And the other one was electricity, which came to Gothic, alternating current electricity for the first time used outside of Telluride at the Ames Power Plant in 1891, when Nikola Tesla and George Westinghouse got together and for the first time ran electricity long distances, powering the Gold King Mine 2,500 feet above Ames, owned by a man named Louis Nunn. Gothic began a long slide downhill as the price of silver dropped before hitting 58 cents an ounce in 1893. And that caused the silver panic of that year. The United States was now on a gold standard and the silver towns began to die. Railroads shut down, smelters shut down, investors stopped coming in. Lou Waite of the Gothic silver record left in 1888 after he said, living on wind pudding, Copper Creek Soup, Gothic Scenery, and Promises of Bunner Subscribers. Jenny Crawford kept the record alive for a while, but finally she grew tired of what she said were snowbanks and of living on rabbit tracks. Lou Waite won the job of mayor in 1884 when he wanted to throw the dice to break a tie with Garwood Judd. Gothic attempted several revivals after 1893, but silver unfortunately was gone forever. A new smelter was put in in 1903, handling ore from the Sylvanite. There you get a great look at Garwood Judd, more about him in a moment, with three young children in 1907 in downtown Gothic. Other mines were looked at again in 1903. The Jim Blaine, two miles north of Gothic, the Mountain King, located at 12,000 feet on a steep slope at the head of Rustler Gulch. The Mountain King, up at the head of Rustler Gulch, had a powerhouse 36 feet square, two boilers, a compressor, and a tram. In 1908, the Blaine Mining and Reduction Company built a large mill right in Gothic and put in a power plant at the edge of town. It was a 10 stamp mill. It got power from the East River. A 20 foot dam was built and water came via a four foot by four foot flume, which ran 600 feet to the mill. The newspaper said, here it is dropped 45 feet upon two turbines, 150 and the other 75 horsepower. Now to Garwood Judd, where you're looking at right now. Garwood Judd was born in Ohio in 1852, took classes in geology at Oberlin in Ohio, and came to Gothic at the age of 28 in 1880. He mined a little. He owned a saloon. He served in many town positions, and he was an amateur geologist. When Gothic became a ghost town, Garwood Judd stayed became a caretaker and a middleman for buying and selling of mine property. By the 1920s, he had become famous as the man who stayed. He entertained those that came through with clippings, ore samples, and stories. Garwood Judd kept a register, which people who came to Gothic signed. In 1928, the Fox Film Company made Judd the subject of a two-reel documentary called the man who stayed. And there's Judd again with his dog in 1929, an old man, one more year to live. Garwood Judd died at the age of 78 in 1930, and his ashes were scattered at Gothic and by Judd Falls by Dr. John C. Johnson and Ben Jorgensen, the county commissioner. And there is the plaque, the man who stayed. 
Garwood Judd, 1852 to 1880. Dr. John C. Johnson, a member of the Western State faculty, first one, 1911, visited Gothic in 1919, and nine years later established the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab as a research station. He left Western State primarily because of the Ku Klux Klan and became professor of biology and chairman of the Department of Science at Penn State College at Westchester, Pennsylvania, with the provision he could return to Colorado every summer. Now go back to that previous photo, if you would. There is Alberta Falls, and today, people, that is named Judd Falls. Go back to the, uh, go, uh, the next one now, Nell. That, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, uh, the Allen boys taking their cattle in 1950 onto the range up above Gothic. They're on the Gothic road with Gothic in the background. The first session of the first summer session of the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab came on June the 25th, 1928. 3,500 bulletins were sent out and a great staff, all with PhDs, taught there. Abandoned cabins were used as living quarters, and the 22-room Grant Hotel was bought by Garwood Judd, from Judd for $3 to serve as the lab. In 1930, Rocky Mountain Biological Lab bought the town site for back taxes, $200. It included 70 acres and 22 old buildings. During the late 1950s, an additional 180 acres were purchased. By 1960, 50 institutions were represented at the lab. Now, this is a photo taken by Carl Haas around 1972 in Gothic as part of his great master's thesis, Gothic City of Silver Wires. I had the great pleasure of meeting Dr. John C. Johnson. And in October of 1966, he came back for homecoming when Mountain Doings was on. These are skits performed in the gymnasium. And I took a photo of him. And Dr. Johnson got maybe the greatest ovation that I have ever heard in all my years at Western as he appeared. I also got to know his, his son, Chris, who became a great friend, and his daughter, Clea, also became a great friend. The Rocky Mountain Biological Lab is nationally and world famous today. They do pioneering studies in climate change, high altitude research, and other scientific endeavors. Ian Billick is the director, and there's great appreciation for all the good work that's been done. And we owe great debt to Dr. John C. Johnson, the man who started it 92 years ago. And one postscript. In 1969, on July the 4th, George Sibley decided that we needed a race to celebrate the 4th of July. So he's the guy who got the race from Gothic to Crested Butte, started eight and a half miles, 1969. It's called the run, walk, or crawl. And Charlie Vigil, an ex-Adam State runner, has got the record 42 minutes and 36 seconds. And George told me that he thought that the initial races would take a lot longer than they did, and he heard somebody yell out, here they come. And he went into the Tony's Conoco, got a bag of flour, and hurriedly spread the flour across the finish line. Legendary Billy Barr still lives in Gothic and has lived there for 44 years with all the weather records. So Gothic, there's Dr. Johnson on the right. So Gothic high elevation, snowy beauty, city of silver wires, a great transport center, rich and colorful history, another piece of the fabulous history of the Gunnison country. That is it, ladies and gentlemen. And now we come to the trivia question and Nell is gonna give you the scoop on how to answer. So for trivia, post into the chat, not the Q&A, in the chat, 
Uh, first person that we see on our end to answer the question correctly will win the trivia prize. Sometimes due to internet delays and connections, it may look like you're out ahead on your end, but somebody else has come in before you on our end. Um, so we just do our best from the tech side. So first person in the chat to answer Dwayne's trivia question. Here is the question. I want the name of one of the three newspapers that appeared in early Gothic. We'll await the answer. There it is. Gothic Minor, who hit first? Let's see here. The Minor with Cara Guerrero? It was, won, I think it was either Cam or Lacey that I saw come up first. Cam says Mountain. No, that's not it. Who's Lacey? Lacey? Lacey, give us your name again. Is the Gothic Minor. Lacey Rector with the Gothic Minor. All right, Lacey, I want you to make sure that you stay on so Nell can get your address. And I'll send you a copy of the Crested Beard book. And now we'll open it up to questions or comments. And uh, also, let me know what you think of that Colorado history class, possibly in the fall with 12 sessions through the Crested Beard Museum again. Any questions? And I'm waiting I, for any questions. Lacey, I have your email due to your registration. So I'm emailing you right now in order to get your mailing address to share with Dwayne. So keep an eye out in your email inbox uh, for that uh, email for me. Questions, all right. Uh, yes, people are in support of the Colorado History Series. They would love that. They're interested in attending that class. Yeah, that's great. We're getting a lot of good comments there. Good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Kim, the uh, answer is yes. Uh, you know, the old uh, the old building that I showed, I think that was the city hall. They've, they've re uh, redone that. And now they sell books. They got ore samples. They have drinks, et cetera. So uh, it's really, really nice. If you go into Gothic today, it's on the right side of the road as you go north. And the museum hosted Ian Billick, director of Rumble, and Dwayne was a part of this as well, last spring. And he talks all about the rehabilitation of the buildings on their town site. You can find that on our YouTube page um, that goes into depth about those buildings that are still there and what's happened to them today. Well, thanks for all the good comments on Colorado history. I think I'm going to do it. All right. Question from Doug. Are T.C. Johnson and John C. Johnson related? They look no like relation at all. Ted Johnson taught at Western, retired about 10 years ago after 50 years, but no relation. Uh, another question. I'm curious to hear more about the black man. I apologize. I did not catch his full name. General something that came to Gunnison country in the mid 1970s. Yeah, his, uh, his name was General Green with an E on the end. He came in in 1872 and unfortunately died two years later and was buried near Gothic. But that's the only reference I've ever seen. So I don't have any more information and I've been through all the papers. Uh, regarding the history class, would you include the topic of the formation of the Rocky Mountains? Uh, well, I'm going to have Dr. Bartleson and Dr. Prather on to do the geology. That'll be one session. I am not uh, equipped to do that, but Bartleson, my good buddy, is an expert on it, and I'm going to talk him into doing it. Uh, we got the question again. Are there any original buildings remaining in Gothic today? Yes, there are. You can find more information about those buildings. Uh, on the uh, museum's uh, YouTube page with Ian Billick, who's director of Rumble and has rehabilitated those buildings. Uh, yeah, they've done why, a good job. Why did Johnson quit working at Western? You know, it's a long story, but basically uh, Dr. Johnson was a Catholic and we had a president that was put in by the Ku Klux Klan, the mayor of Denver, member of the Klan, the state legislature, member of the Klan, the governor, member of the Klan, which is no disrespect to this area because the Klan kind of controlled the whole damn country. And if you didn't uh, have support from the Klan or be a member, uh, you were done. So Dr. Johnson pretty much was forced out. And uh, we lost a great faculty member, but the good thing about it is that he was able to form the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab. And you know, Carol and Doug Johnson, who are on board, I think tonight, 
might even give you a little more information on that. So if uh, Carol or Doug, if you're on board and you got a little more info, please uh, give it to us on the chat board. Uh, next question, when was the three-story hotel torn down? You know, don't know exactly. Uh, you know, one of the hotels was still there in 1928. And uh, then, as I mentioned in the talk, uh, it, the roof caved in and it was sold for lumber. So I would say, uh, you know, late 1920s, right in there. Okay. Uh, what were the five great silver towns of Colorado? Well, if you're talking about Colorado, uh, I'll give you three off the top of my head were the best. Cripple Creek Victor, number one, Leadville, number two, Aspen, number three, probably Central City, Telluride, Silverton would all be in there as uh, possibilities for four, five, and six. In the Gunnison country, Irwin, Gothic, Tin Cup, Pitkin, and White Pine. All right. Um Comment, sounds like a session about the Ku Klux Klan in Colorado would be a good subject. Yeah, you know, that that's something that I may may do. Um, I'll try and see if I can work that in maybe next time. Uh, they, it's pretty interesting. And here's Carol talking. Uh, Dr. Johnson was a Catholic, but he refused to join the Klan and was accordingly forced out. Thank you, Carol. Let's see. See, somebody notes that we should name a building on Western's campus after John C. Johnson. I would think that would be a tremendous thing to do. One of the original members of the faculty, there were, I think there were 14 members of the faculty and he was one. Here's a, a comment. My son's going to be studying at the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab. All right, well, uh, everybody pulls together their last questions. A huge thank you to our sponsors one more time. Uh, thank you to Western Colorado University Alumni Relations, as well as Bill Petros and Bluebird Realty. You bet, any other questions or uh, any other chats? What's next week's topic, Dwayne? Next week's topic, Lake City and Aspen. Right. And a lot of exciting stuff from Alfred Packer to the start of the ski industry. Yeah, thank you, Marianne. Any other chats? Go ahead and hit. Yeah, thank you, folks, for checking in. Yeah, we'll see you for Flashank. Don't forget, next Wednesday, 7 o'clock, sign up at CrestedViewMuseum.com. Yeah. yeah, next Wednesday, Nell. Next Wednesday. Did I say yeah, Thursday? Yeah, I said Monday. Yeah, next okay. Wednesday. We hope you're all aboard, folks, for Flushing and the great ski history. And uh, some of you who are from Crested Butte South and Crested Butte, get your butts down to Cochever so we can do a little polka dancing. I'm excited. Look forward to it. <laughs> yeah, Bruce Bartleson was on board tonight. Uh, Bruce. Uh, hit the chat board and tell me if I can convince you to give one of those 12 lectures on geology in that Colorado history class in the fall. I'm putting Bruce on the spot. <laughs> he may be off already. Any other questions anybody has? Did you polka in Gothic? Asked Pete Dunda. I have not. But, uh, you know, we polka near there, Pete, you and I, uh, while well, you playing and me polkaing on the top of Crested Butte Mountain. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Uh, I think we made it above 135 this evening. I didn't catch the exact number before people started logging off, but thanks Wonderful. everybody for being here again. Wonderful, and thanks, Ashley, for being on board. I'm looking forward to working with you. <laughs> oh, how did Devil's Punch Bowl get its name? Thank you. We'll see you in class tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Bye. Devil's Punch Bowl got its name because of the danger of those two punch bowls that you had out there. A lot of people, not a lot of people, but a few people died either by avalanches and, and or drowning. So, you know, the devil obviously was involved.
Lisa, thanks for the comment. Nell, thank you very much. Thank you. Over and out.